Hey everybody, I'm Susanna Johnson with um, the 24 Hours for Change in Education, bringing the conversation to Hawaii in the U.S. And I'm so thrilled to be here. Apologies for the voice today. It's um, the biggest conference of the year in Hawaii, the Schools of the Future Conference. And so with lots of presentations happening, I've, um, I've lost a little bit of my voice. So I appreciate your patience on all of that. I'm going to talk a little bit um, today about the power of connection for a little while and why connection has made change possible and come to life and it continues to drive us forward for what's happening in the landscape of education in Hawaii. Um, in a little while, I'll be joined by a wonderful student who is um, thinking a lot about all of this. She's got a, a podcast and so look forward to introducing her when she gets out of class in a little while. The um, Logos that you see here are the different organizations that I'm affiliated with. My own business is Individualized Realized, and I also partner with What School Could Be, uh, Impact, and then also Personalized Learning Network with one of our um, great co-hosts, Gabriel. So thanks so much for joining me in Hawaii, and I uh, hope that you can learn a little bit about what's happening because I spend every day excited about the future of education because of all the people that I'm working with here in Hawaii. So hopefully we'll get to that message. In terms of what's happening in Hawaii and the landscape, as I mentioned, we are at this um, Schools of the Future conference. So I wanted just to start off with this early morning video that, that I took as we were setting things up today and what's happening. And it'll give you the snapshot of what's um, going on. There's not a lot of sound, so I'll kind of keep it quiet, try to talk over it a little bit. But we've got this fantastical Imaginarium going on to kind of connect everybody. But what's great about this is in the room, having this conversation all day for the next two days at this conference are educators, students, technology companies, other big companies. We've got some different people who are providers of all kinds of resources. We've got Teach for America in the room. So what this shows, this just kind of little snapshot of this room that we're all hanging out in, is that we work together. And I don't say that lightly because I recognize it's taken us a long journey to get here. And I, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. But it's really interesting to see what happens when community members and business members and students and educators and families come together in order to try to think about how we can move education forward and what's best for our learners, not just now, but also for the future. We're um, in the process right now of a major initiative of investing in the future of our keiki, which is the word for kids in Hawaiian. And that is really about bringing all these powers together for the future. So it's a pretty exciting time. And um, as I mentioned, Everybody is here, there are over 2,000 people at this conference over the next couple of days coming in from all over the place, not just Hawaii, um, but bringing us together in the name of what's best for education. Sorry, move forward here. I want to talk a little bit about the landscape of education in Hawaii. And what's interesting to understand is that as though, even though we're spread out over all these different islands, um, we are one public school district. We have what we call complex areas, which helps to give us a little bit of that regional perspective. But we um, we really are all in, in one department of education, which means it's a very huge animal to think about and to manage. We've got um, 165,000 students in 256 schools in the Department of Education. 37 schools in our public charter school organization with over 11,000 students and then upwards of 20,000 students at this point in our independent schools. And the reason I like to start off with this part of the conversation has a lot to do with the fact that these organizations don't often play nicely with each other in a lot of places. But here in Hawaii, we're all connected and we all work together for what's best for education. And it's very unique in that aspect. We've come together over the course of um, many years, and, and I'll tell that journey as, as we go through this today, but realistically, I've been all over the country. I've been in a lot of other countries around the world. It just doesn't happen this way. Department of Education and private schools not necessarily playing nice. Charter schools kind of trying to bridge that gap in some areas, but also sometimes trying to just make it their own thing. And the word competition comes up a lot, but um, we'll get into it a little bit today. We like to use the word cooperation here in Hawaii. It's kind of fun. We like to make up words too. To understand our context, and I don't think this is unique to us, 
the context of Hawaii is that obviously we have a very strong cultural history and ohana values are what rule things here. Ohana is the word for family um, in Hawaiian and understanding that this is a very special and unique culture from the get-go is, is important, but it continues to be so. We're constantly thinking about what does it mean to be connected to our island home? What does it mean to be separated from the world as much as we are? Um, when you look at the globe, or it's you know very interesting to see we're not our own country out here. We are part of another country, but we are very, very far away from almost anything. So we have to always be thinking about how are we being stewards, not only of our land and the place that we live, but also of our our culture and of what matters to us. For us, that Ohana values is not just about our own families, our own personal families, but about the family that we consider our community, both locally and globally. We always are thinking about how are we connecting to everybody around us? Because we understand based on all of these traditional Hawaiian values that we couldn't exist if we didn't have each other. Anybody tries to do this in any kind of a siloed way, any forward momentum and any initiatives trying to take care of the climate, trying to take care of our economy, trying to take care of our education system, we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't do it with a sense of community. So that's really important. Diversity rules everything here. And that's not to say that we don't have issues with diversity and equitable practices, but we for sure have to think a lot about the fact that we have our indigenous population. We also have all of our transplanted population, um, settlers, colonizers, but we like to just use the word transplant because we are still really um, steeped in that idea of it being a melting pot. In Hawaii, we've got a really strong um, cultural landscape that is is very diverse. And so we've got a lot of Asia Pacific cultures. We've got, of course, a lot of mainland cultures, European backgrounds, and then of course, all of the Polynesian and indigenous cultures. So we have to honor that and think about that when we think about investing in our future and also how we're handling education. Geography is important um, when you're an island, right? And especially because we are an island state. So we are several islands that come together on a regular basis to think about education and, and we have to work together. And as I mentioned, being all under one public district means that we have to think about all of those different nuances, right? So we've got incredibly rural populations. Um, our island of Molokai is less than 15,000 people altogether. And they have an incredible school system. And in fact, in my opinion, one of the best I've seen in the country because of a couple of key people who've decided to invest in it and then invited the whole community to come in and work towards that. We've also got a really strong urban population here on Oahu, the island that I'm on in Honolulu, and um, which is the one that you see there in the, the picture with Diamond Head in the background and gorgeous Waikiki. And Although many of you have maybe visited Hawaii and seen that gorgeous landscape, what it means to live in a really densely populated setting matters, right? So we have to think about that geography all the time. Of course, our capacity and what we can do is limited in certain ways because of our disconnection from other places. Um, all of our supplies have to be brought in in certain ways unless we can figure out how to make them come to life here. To that end, we have a very strong connection with education and agriculture and how that's moving forward for sustainability for Hawaii. We have incredible organizations like Oceanit, which I'll talk about. It's a major company and corporation here in Hawaii. We also have the United States military presence that helps us to think about ways that we can move forward in terms of supporting the island and the sustainability factor for education. We also can think about momentum. Um, for us, it could be very easy just to relax and enjoy paradise, but we don't want to do that and stop thinking about what's best for our future and making sure that we are honoring all of those um, different practices that come to life, making sure that we are giving them some life, right? Challenges, we'll talk about a little bit today and, and there'll be some moments I'll talk about how we've come together to this moment in 2022 where all of these organizations are working together for education. The challenges along the way um, have, that have gotten us here, even though they, they've come up, we've all worked together to problem solve them. And so I think that that makes a huge, huge difference in terms of how we've approached it. It's not to say that we don't still have challenges. Of course we do. Um, 
we get forgotten about a lot when it comes to the landscape of education. We're doing things that are incredibly forward thinking and innovative, and a lot of the rest of the country forgets that we even exist. And so we've got to keep that in mind um, in terms of trying to make um, one of our exports be the great ideas that have happened here in Hawaiian education. For us, connecting the innovators was how we got started. And so um, back in 2008, individual technology grants came together and were combined based on a, the Hawaii Community Foundation helped to bring all of that together for a five-year, um, $5 million initiative that was challenging all of our independent schools to write plans for transformation so that they could become schools of the future. And instead of focusing on using that money for buying technology, they were asked how they would change teaching, learning, and assessment in their schools. So this initiative was supported by quarterly meetups and an online community for the first time, which was kind of a big deal in 2008, um, in, in order to help to build that strong practice around what we were learning and how we could share it with each other which is sort of the key thing about this connection and coming together. It's part of the work we all met and talked to experts. We shared our best practices, opened up our campuses to each other so that we can learn as a community. So schools that had once been in competition with each other now had a reason to work together and learn together for this initiative. In this, we had some challenges, as I mentioned, um, and one of those was building that culture of sharing and community with some of these foundational schools, right? So I mentioned that we started with the independent schools, and so independent schools are always fighting for dollars, and I think that a lot of communities around the world understand that, but getting families to choose the different schools, we realized that every school has something special and unique to offer. We're doing various different things that were wonderful and positive. And so learning from each other and helping each other grow was a way that this started to move forward in a more sustainable conversation about these virtual communities of practice coming together. This initiative actually ended in 2014. So at that point, we had to find ways to be able to stay connected and continue to learn. The Schools of the Future Conference was sort of our answer to that, and that started the first Schools of the Future Conference started in 2010, and it grew from that first day. I was actually at that conference. There were a few hundred people there to, like I mentioned today, we have over 2,000 people attending the conference. And in terms of keeping it true to being a collaborative effort, we invited in the representation from the public and the charter schools, along with these independent schools, as members of the planning committee for that execution, as well as finding grant money from outside, as well as state money, to be, make sure that it was equitable in terms of the availability and accessibility for all of the educators. So this coordination continues to evolve as more members come into that planning group and keeping this conference as something that is that collaborative effort. So the way that this came together is that one member of the um, cohort planning group was part of the grant initiative from each of the different organizations. And so at that point, that cohort started to come together and travel together to be able to do learning walks in different organizations and schools, to be able to go to other places in the country that had incredible school um, efforts, things that we could see like High Tech High in San Diego and in Denver and one school in, or excuse me, one stone in Boise, Idaho. And so um, that worked for us. And we also started to attend the International Society for Technology and Education Conference together as a cohort. So this inspiration really started to bring together some of the tech, some of the innovation and also this role of or this this mindset of us being in this revolution for education together as a community right um we learned early on how to work on a shoestring budget and so one of the most important things I can talk about in terms of what makes it work is that we just ask everybody to participate. Um, in that room that I showed you in the beginning of our conversation today, all of those community partners and businesses are there, not because we're paying them, but because they want to be part of the conversation because they care about the future of our community. So I think that that's something that's really, really important in terms of how we're moving forward for what's best for education. Our next step was connecting the leaders. So we um, talked a little bit about the, that catalyst for the, the grant, but in that we actually started to form this group of leaders from the independent charter and public schools. 
um, where the administration were, were getting together in conversations on a regular basis. And so we did a lot of different initiatives. You can see some of those in the pictures, but those are all pictures of administrators coming together. And again, I don't say that lightly because I understand that it's not normal or natural for a lot of um, school heads to get together and, and play nice with each other. But what's interesting about this is that the superintendents, um, the superintendent of the state, which is, again, we're just one department. And so we had this one superintendent started to organize an initial convening in January of 2011. So we're now 11 years into that conversation. And what's great about it is that 100% of people invited attended and still do to this, this day where they get together on a quarterly basis to have a meeting. What's also interesting is that here on Oahu, the heads of the public, private, and charter school organizations actually still get together for breakfast every week to talk about what's happening and ways that they can support each other. Again, not a small thing when we're thinking about this in the landscape of what matters for education and moving us forward. Of course, connecting the teachers had to happen as well. So we um, certainly have the conference where we all get together and we get to see each other and have fun, play, get inspired, share ideas. Um, but in addition to that, there was um, part of the grant money that was given went to a master's program which combined the um, Hawaii Association of Independent Schools actually helped to put it together. But we work with the University of Hawaii and Chaminade University in order for educators to get a master's degree for, at that time, it was quite a bit less than what the regular master's program was. Um, I myself got my master's of education through that program. And what mattered about that was not just about the fact that we had the opportunity to do that as educators and work with other educators, but we were learning from some of the best of the best educators in Hawaii. That's not a small thing either, because now I have all of these amazing connections, mentors that I can continue to go to and work with all the time in terms of what's best for not only me, my students, the classroom, but the future of education. Um, additionally, we started an organization through one of the um, local schools, Mid-Pacific Institute, called Kupuho Academy. And Kupuho is about helping schools to transform their own organization. And that continued to evolve into, at this point, they've got their own academy, and at least 2,000 teachers a year attend that um, to be able to think about how they're going to move forward for deeper learning in school every day. Over 1,000 teachers have gone through that program at this point. So the um, story of PBL Works in Hawaii also matters because PBL Works started to partner with the state and local um, founders to help to train teachers as well and scaling high quality project-based learning through a grant um, that was also a federal grant. So trying to figure out ways that we could work together, but with, again, these teachers coming together to partner meant that we were learning about what was happening in each other's classrooms. That's important, allowing teachers time to talk and share about what's happening. Same thing with EdCamp coming to Hawaii. And if you're not familiar with EdCamp, um, EdCamp is actually a put together by the actual participants deciding what's going to be the driving question for the day. It's a sort of unconference for professional development for educators, which is really fun. Organized by volunteers and the session topics that are determined on the spot. And it, it kind of works together to make sure that we've got these amazing educators talking to each other and sharing their ideas. So that grassroots movement of, of all these different grants and organizations and people coming together is our constant reminder that we is us, all of us in education in Hawaii, but not directed from any governing body. Very important to understand, nobody's in charge, we are all in this together. Connecting the community and culture is really important for us. You see here the HA initiative, um, which is the word for breath in Hawaiian, and that's actually in our state standards and our state charters. So all public schools in Hawaii um, adhere to this. The Office of Hawaiian Education came together with the Department of Education to put together what they call um, Nahupena Ao, which forgive my Hawaiian, those of you who know it, um, the, this is the breath of life. And it's meant to strengthen our sense of belonging, responsibility, excellence, aloha, total well-being, and the state of Hawaii. Ha. What's exciting about this is that um, 
it actually helps us to maintain that sense of past, present, and future in terms of our cultural identity, our sense of community, and it helps our families, everybody who's here in Hawaii and the kids that are going to school to maintain that grounding, something that is we can all tether to, to keep us thinking about what's best for education. And so every time somebody's trying to do something new in a school and move a school forward, they have to think about how does this fit within the ha? How does this fit within our values? And what's really exciting is that as we started this initiative, it was really fun to see that it brought together this lifelong learning mentality but students really got excited about this. They saw themselves in this. They understood that really specific thing and, and made it something that was their own. In addition to connecting the community via HA, we've also um, got our community partners. So deeper learning necessitates authentic community partners. And in addition to our teachers and leaders, the industry and community partners plugging in mattered. These partners um, that we started to bring to the table saw the movement and the openness and magic and, and it started to happen. One of my favorite examples that I like to talk about is Ocean. And as I mentioned, yes, they're a huge corporation. They do a lot of incredible work. Um, not just here, but globally, but they're based here in Hawaii and they're an engineering and technology firm. And they started to offer design thinking workshops for educators for free way, way back in 2011. Um, I actually went to one of those and, then, and it was really fun to see that process and infuse design thinking in education in a strong way. We're able to make them a critical partner. Um, the beautiful thing about Ocean is that they provide mentorships and internships with students to schools all over the place. They do Altino training for robotics work. I actually um, had a student that I, not just one student, but one student every year for over 10 years at the school I was working at that would be there for a mentorship. So they go to work every Wednesday and spend all day working, not just kind of shadowing and learning about the business, but contributing to the coding of projects, building things that were connected in really strong ways. So it's really important important to think about that connection to community and culture as it came together there. Um, additionally, we were able to bring together the education incubator, uh, and they provide the framework so that there's a, a place for workshops and collaborative sessions to happen. So right here in the, the middle of Honolulu, on a regular basis, you'll see leaders, teachers, and students doing all different kinds of projects together. This collaboration continues to be that framework that keeps us grounded in our ha. Along the way, too, we've got a lot of our storytellers, and I don't want to minimize that in this conversation, but our journalists, Honolulu Civilly, Honolulu Magazine, our business magazine, all of our local news networks constantly spent time asking questions and writing about what was going down in Hawaii's deeper learning communities. So we um, continue to have this fantastic collective of sharing the stories of what's happening all over Hawaii education. Every day there's something in each of those different news organizations, and that's powerful. It matters for us. So what made it work for all of us? What was the thing that brought us all together? And it's a pretty simple answer to start off with. We all have the exact same answer, and it's just students. So we're going to meet um, Aria as soon as she gets out of class and starts to join the conversation. But um, for us in education in Hawaii, that's the center of every conversation we have. For us, student-centered learning isn't just a buzzword. It's our ethos. It's how we do everything that we do. So I'm going to run through really quickly a couple of um, slides here from different educators talking about how this all comes together and what made it work for us to be able to be in this sense of community and collaborative um, education thinking. So first and foremost here, um, Matt Zatello, who is with the Hawaii Technology Academy, a charter school organization, um, and, you know, Matt really thinks about that collaboration and feels that grounding. So this charter school actually is um, always been a hybrid since their inception. They're, uh, I think, 10 years old now. And they um, actually are in school only a couple of days a week and the other days are virtual. So when the great disruption of COVID happened globally, Hawaii Technology Academy was ready to go on all of that and became a leader in helping other schools figure out how to make it work. They actually did workshops, were supporting people, their teachers spent time in other classrooms to make things come together um, and how things were, were building. I, of course, um, talked a little bit about my own company, Individualized Realized, but for me, 
the, the key concept that supported the work was having students at the center. So in the classroom, when I was still in the classroom, I actually spent over eight years developing and implementing 100% individualized curriculum. And I did that with the support of my school, but it was really about the students making it happen and driving it forward. And what was great about it is that we continue to think about that human approach to learning that is rooted in authenticity and aiming on unlimited potentials for every learner. Most importantly, we trusted that everyone holds this value at the core. So when I, I say we, I'm still talking about that collective sense of community. So extraneous tasks fall away in order to make sense for what's really best for learners. And students also are part of the Schools of the Future Conference. There's um, not just several rooms where students are exhibiting their work, but they're actually teaching workshops to teachers um, over the next two days, sharing their work, the learning, and how personalized learning models have made something really powerful happen, giving the voice not just to the students, but making them the focus. Of course, um, courage to be bold and brave is, is important. You have to be able to take these risks. And so having, you know, um, politicians that are in office trying to make things come together really mattered. For us, uh, Dr. Christina Kishimoto, who's um, our superintendent for a long time and our new um, superintendent actually recently, these superintendents believe that it's they're not interested just in the Department of Education, they're interested in this collaboration. And so bringing everybody together with that continued mindset of being able to share, be open and be brave matters. Um, we talk a lot about being unmoored from the dock here in Hawaii as an island state. And so it's really important to think about it that we are many va, which means canoe, but also on one voyage together, something that is steeped in our ancestral um, understanding, the Polynesian cultural understanding. The technology, of course, matters. So um, Lee Fitzgerald works for the Mid-Pacific Institute um, and thinks a lot about how our technology means that we have to leverage technology for these meetings and conversations along the way. So we were Zooming long before the rest of the world was Zooming, long before COVID required it of our classrooms, and recognize that we could connect leaders, teachers, and students agnostic of location and build up that trust that it's okay to use technology to make something powerful happen, whether you can be in person or not. Same thing in terms of our social media and leveraging something that exists for everybody. And so um, there was a Schools of the Future principal who started to shout out what was happening and 808 Educate became a hashtag and it's still an extremely powerful hashtag today and bringing together some of these conversations. But we've got now 808 Educate has its own set of offices and people who work for that organization full-time. They've got some grant money and people support the work that they're doing because they recognize that it mattered. Additionally, we've got the What School Could Be podcast in Hawaii, which is actually long before there was the global What School Could Be organization and podcast. And um, Josh Rapoon is, is our leader in that. He actually has been telling these stories for many, many years about innovation and featuring what's happening, sharing it out. You can find that podcast actually um, on anywhere that you find podcasts, but it's really fun to hear these stories. Um, first of, of all the Hawaii educators, but now of all these global educators coming together. Systems thinking mattered as well. So um, Evan from Kamehameha Schools, which is um, our local organization that actually works for honoring ancient Hawaiians and the, the Hawaiian culture, um, they understood that in, in ancient Hawaii that their environment and their relationships made it important to connect with whatever was modern at the moment. And we think about that on a regular basis. So the correlations between indigenous Hawaiian creation myths and quantum physics is a regular part of our conversation. Understanding when it's important to harvest sea urchins and plant things on the mountains is just as important as understanding the digital and technological ecosystems that exist. So I want to make sure to honor that we are thinking about this, not just from the technology standpoint, but from a much bigger data collection standpoint. And so Evan's done this thing that you can see here. It's sort of this matrix connection of all the different organizations and the commitment to the old systems thinking, as well as the new systems thinking has helped us to think about power and um, capability for Hawaii educators and how they can come together. 
cooperation I mentioned before, um, and that's pretty fun. Uh, Melissa talks about this. She is a uh, self-proclaimed digital geek. Uh, and so making sure that we were supporting each other while we were also mildly comp competing for things made it really important. So connecting people from other schools and convincing them that the competition for resources was not what we needed to do, that there we could make sure that we were cooperating to make sure that resources were more equitable and leveraged in a way that encouraged schools and students to work together and move ahead. So it's the idea that all teams should do their best to assist and work with each other, even if an attitude of kindness um, as an attitude of kindness and, and respect exists, right? So everybody is a team in this mindset. Um, and then of course, paddling together is our conversation. So the big Hawaiian canoes and thinking about it, if everybody just dips their paddle in the water and moves forward, they're joining in the effort to move things ahead. And so our, our canoes moving separately, but on one voyage to help us move ahead, is our collective determination to continue to add voices to the conversation, to strengthen the movement, and importantly, to continue to build capacity through all the different facets of leadership in the classrooms and in schools and across the state. And then, of course, courage and risk. And I, again, don't say that lightly. So for all of us, we have to think about being vulnerable and acknowledging it. Yesterday afternoon, um, all the leaders of the different schools in Hawaii came together for the leading schools of the future preamble to the big conference and spent some time really digging into their own storytelling. What makes a great leader is that vulnerability and being able to acknowledge that leaders don't always know everything and that that's okay, but it's about taking risk and asking for help and encouraging people to take some steps to move forward in terms of what's best for education. Our master navigator, Nainoa Thompson of the Malama Honua Worldwide Voyage, reminds us that our voyage is not just a physical one, but that there are ideas in our minds that become new doors of knowledge. And that's what this is all about. When we're addressing, when he was addressing the graduating class in 2020, he said, what this world need, needs now more than ever are navigators. And it's our hope that you understand that you are navigating your own journey, your own organizations, your own change in education. Very important for us to think about this. And so in order to navigate, you must be brave and you also must remember. So this is just me, our little shout out for what's happening. I want to take a second to move into this mindset about moving into action. Um, I don't see it. Aria uh, has joined the room. Okay. I'm actually going to link this so that we have it because I want to have some time if we have time at the end, but I want to honor Aria's time and make sure that we can get into our conversation with her. But um, this Beyond the Lure video, again, I'll link it in the YouTube notes, make sure that we've got it, is a great Inside the Classroom series. It's only seven minutes to take a look at what's happening in, in schools and in Hawaii. But um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of come out of here. So good morning, Aria. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to let you do your own introduction of who you are, where you are, where you're coming from. You can think about it in terms of what's your weather, like Auntie Pooh always um, starts conversation. So it's really important to think about this. But um, I first wanted to say that I met Aria because she asked me to enter for an interview for her podcast. And was that two or three years ago, Aria? That was two years ago. Two years ago, right? So we've got in our midst a very accomplished podcaster. <laughs> who's talking about education and she has been bringing the stories of educators and what's happening in education to life for a really long time. So thanks so much for being here. You want to tell us a little bit Aria, about yourself and about where you're coming from in your background before we get into the hard questions? Yeah, so I'm Aria Sains. I am a current senior at Punahou School. And the reason why I got into education and the way students learn is because I have a little sister who has autism. So from a young age, I knew that there were all different types of learners and that schools needed to accommodate for these learners. I participated in the pilot program at Punahou School called GSD, Global Sustainability and Development. And it was a project-based and competency-based learning course. And uh, in the the beginning years of um, having this course at Punahou, there was obviously a lot of uh, retaliation and backlash. We also got positive feedback, but I think that because it was new and um, the community did not expect such a course to be a part of the Punahou curriculum, um, there were a lot of questions and uh, even students and parents who 
who were, I guess, spreading, uh, I guess, misinformation or because they were scared. And that is understandable because it's such a big change. But I wanted to demystify these teaching pedagogies. So I invited um, educators from around the world um, to talk about project based learning and CVL and even individualized curriculum to talk about why it's not so scary and why it should be uh, applicable to every student. I love that. And is, how many episodes have you recorded on your podcast? Um, because I do all my own editing, um, it's been taking a while, but I believe I have eight. Uh, they're usually like two and a half hours and I cut them down by myself to like 30 minutes, but I'm hoping to get more out soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and in that conversation, even though you've got eight actual episodes out, you've had lots of conversation with, with educators, right? So the other day we were at a an event together, um, Ari and I ran into each other at this investing in education um, community event, which was bringing together business leaders and funders to talk about the investment in education. And um, even in that room, you're talking to several educators. And so um, to start off with, I, I hope that you can share with us that in all these conversations with educators through the, all of your work and, and in your podcast, what do you see as what's needed for change in education? I think that uh, student and parent involvement is very important just because even if there are many educators who are starting to invest in these kind of pedagogies, if the parents and students are against it, schools can make those changes because as a school and as an administration, they have to adhere to these values that the parents have. And if parents are against it, then they're going to get a lot of backlash and they can't make the changes even if they want to. So I feel like involving parents and students within these discussions is the most important part because even my friends, people who didn't participate in this GSD class, they were saying things like, it's project-based learning, like you guys don't get grades, you guys don't get feedback, you guys don't get anything from teachers, you guys kind of just like do whatever and you know, in the end, get a grade. And I think these kind of, uh, these types of information was circulating around the school community because parents and students were not involved in the discussion. So I feel like that is first and foremost, the most important part of, yeah, involving um, the community. Well, and that's, I, I feel like you're absolutely spot on and, and all the different travels I've had and, and different schools I've worked with, it's, it's a lot of those same things. There are a lot of excited students and a lot of excited educators, but at some point somebody says no to possibility. And sometimes it's at an administrative level, sometimes it's at a policy level, but often it's at the family level. And so helping to change our conversation around what's best for education is, is really, really important. Are there... Can you speak to any of the ways that you've helped to or thought about how we can change that conversation? Like what are what have you done to help to talk to your friends besides just your friends? How do you help change that mindset or that um, misconception in your school? Well, I was invited to a PFA meeting uh, where uh, parents were allowed to ask me and uh, maybe like one other student as well as a person who was actually teaching one of these courses. And in that meeting, I think we were able to clear up a lot of the information that was circulating, especially because when parents like parents want to be involved in their children's education. They really want that and they just want what's best for their child. So if you can somehow showcase that and have an open forum where they can ask these questions, it's a lot better for the school community and you can get a lot more done. I love that. And, and so as you've talked to more parents, are they starting to help to shift their own mindsets and figure out ways that, that they can support changing that, that narrative? Um, I'm sorry, you cut out for a second. What was the first I'm so part? sorry. <laughs> Just as you've, as you've had these conversations with parents, have you been able to help shift some of those mindsets and, and ideas? Have you been able to spread it? Has it changed a little bit? I think the college admissions process was the number one question that I got. And a lot of people were worried about because they think that when you have alternative learning environments and a curriculum, it's going to affect your chances of getting into an elite college. Um, but what we've seen is that 
design thinking and innovation, those are core values in our society currently. And colleges actually value those ideas because they want students who are self-motivated. They want students who want to create and do things in the world. And I think because the curriculum spawns those ideas, they are actually very supportive. And once you kind of tell them that narrative, they are much uh, more open to accepting these ideas. I love that. Yeah. And that's, it's really important because it's, you're right. Every parent wants what's best for their child, which means keeping all the doors open and opportunities possible. And so it's, it is about what's next, what's after the primary school, the secondary level, like what happens when you go into post-secondary work. Right. So I love that. Um, we can we can honor the the respect that we both have for the school that you go to but it is a wonderful big but private school um and as you mentioned it is a, a privilege to be able to go to those um, kinds of schools we get that um but in this wonderful big school with a lot of incredible resources and really smart really creative teachers and a very motivated student population um there are, we've had some moments of, of change, things that have started, but then the momentum sometimes stops. And you and I were chatting about this a little bit the other day. And so what are some of your thoughts on why that momentum stops? Why schools start to make changes, but then get paused or get feel like they are, are held back in a certain way? I think um, these curriculum and these classes are supported by the teachers that started it and want it to spread. And I think that a large part of it is that when those teachers leave or there's like a change in um, the people who are, I guess, uh, endorsing these classes, it definitely changes because the people who kind of um, took this as their baby and kind of formulated the curriculum are not there to support it anymore. So I feel like if you get someone who isn't as uh, informed about how you run it or the type of curriculum that you're supposed to construct, and then it becomes more difficult to sustain the ideas that they started in the first place. Um, and also, when change happens, it goes back a few years. Every, you know, it's not always an uphill battle. You know, it's like one step forward, two steps back. So I feel like it was a good start, and I hope that in the future it continues. I appreciate that that metaphor and because I think that all of us that are trying to move education forward experience that on a regular basis. It is one step forward, two steps back. Um, and so motivation to continue to do this comes from working with, with students like you. If you could design the future of education, if you could describe what it looks like, sounds like, feels like, includes, what would school, what would your favorite school of the future look like? What would it be if you could be in charge of, of education for the whole world? Well, I'm a strong believer in open curriculum. I think that I know that a lot of colleges have an open curriculum, but I also think that high schools should have open curriculum. And the reason why is because it allows students to test different uh, subjects, but ultimately it enforces the idea that you are in charge of your own education and that you have agency in the type of learning that you want to participate in. So if a student is really passionate about, you know, design thinking, they like uh, engineering, they like building things, then I don't think that it is beneficial for them to force them to take certain credits like you know, a writing course when that is not their passion. Of course, I do believe that, you know, you need to have the basics, but I think those basics can also be taught in middle school. Like that's when you're building the foundational uh, skills so that you can write, read, you know, solve basic math problems like percentages. But after that, I think that's when you start building these human beings to go out in the world and do things for, you know, society. So I do believe that a type of open curriculum should be encouraged in high schools. I love that. If it's okay with you, I want to go mildly personal and, and just, you know, take a pass on anything you don't want to talk about. But in terms of your own education, what stands out to you as like the most meaningful part of it or the best experiences? What's helped you with success or what are some of your success stories and what were the things that got you there? Because I think as educators, we, we think we know what, what equals success, but we don't always know. And we also 
want what's best for, for learners, but we don't necessarily listen enough to what you have to say. So if you wouldn't mind sharing some standout examples from your own educational journey of, of like what's worked for you, um, and maybe also even like what kind of a learner you are or educators that stand out to you along the way. Um, I am, well, first, I'm not like an auditory or visual learner. I need to do things. I need to do the work in order for me to understand it. So math class is especially difficult for me because when it's a lecture based or the teacher is doing it up on the board, I don't quite understand it. Um, I need someone there to help me get through it. And I think that's what I've noticed um, in my entire educational journey is that when I do a project or something that I'm passionate about, like if I'm given the opportunity to uh, pursue something that I enjoy, then I tend to learn a lot more. So especially with this podcast, it was a part of a mentorship uh, GSD class that I took in sophomore year. And basically the class was, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? Like, what kind of changes do you want to make in your community? And then do it. We'll give you the support. We'll give you the resources. Just do it. And I think this idea of mentorship and the idea of teachers being there as coaches instead of teachers makes my makes our educational journey a lot better because a coach is there to guide you and mentor you not to kind of put you down and uh i guess uh sort you into difficult like skill set because that's what honor and ap is right like teachers grade you they sort you into boxes and then they're like okay <laughs> these kids are great they're smart this is what they're going to do and i think then it becomes more of a comp competition and you're almost uh trying to impress the teacher i feel like students shouldn't learn to impress they should um learn to do and i think having coaches as teachers that's a better mindset for us yeah can you describe for me maybe um, an example or like a, one of those relationships where a teacher has been a coach? Like, what did that look like, sound like, feel like? How did they approach the work with you to help you move forward in your learning? It, when you talk to them, it's almost as if they're like equals. You're having a conversation with them. So if when it came to grades or, you know, how you were doing in the class or how your project was going, it's an open conversation. Like, what have you had trouble with? And you can be completely honest. Like, if it's like a more of a teacher mentality, then you're afraid to almost admit your failures because you know that you're gonna be graded on that. But when you have an open conversation as equals, you can admit to your failures and be like, actually, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. I'm actually don't know what to do. But when you have a coach mentality, you're not afraid that you're gonna get like a B because you're stuck you're like excited to move forward and you know that the teacher is there to support you. So the teacher might be like, okay, how about I do this? You know, how about we work on this first and then we can see how you go from there to, you know, finishing your project. So this discourse is very important for me. Um, and I think that connection builds a really safe environment for everyone to admit to their failures. It's not toxic anymore. I love that because you're getting into something that we all know is important, which is making sure that we're honoring the humanity and honoring the whole human in the classroom, right? And and I love that that relationship and that conversation. Um, certainly, what it was what I was trying to do when I was still in the classroom as a teacher, although I always felt like the coach and and the coworker in the learning journey. But same thing when you and I first met a couple of years ago. It's it's not about me telling you what's right or wrong. It's about us learning together about how to move things forward for what's best for education. So I appreciate that um, that rapport, that conversation, and like you said, the dialogue, right? It's really about that. Do you feel like most students, most learners, a lot of your peers, they want learning to be like you want it to be? Do you think that that's something that is because I, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of you've grown up in as a digital native in a world that is entirely different than what I grew up in, right? And so what what do you think most students want for their own educational experience? What do your friends want? What have you heard people talk about? What are you seeing globally? I think students are tired of the rat race. I think students are tired of um, being so pressured about grades or classes that they don't care about. But I think the real pressure comes from, it still comes from college. And I 
I think a lot of my friends understand that education needs to move forward. They want to pursue classes that they are passionate about. Like I had someone come up to me and they were like, I really wish I did GSD or I really wish I took EPS, which is environmental problem solving. It's a project-based course that I'm taking currently. And I was like, well, why didn't you take them? And they were like, well, like my parents said, it's not a real class. And I was like, so students understand that that's the better way to learn, or at least it's an alternative to the current system. They understand that it produces better learners and more passionate people. It's just, it's very difficult for them to commit to these a type of curricula because of this parental pressure that you know we as college prep school students have. And so I think that's why it's so important to engage parents in these conversations. I think we need to target these parents. But my hope is that when we grow up and we become parents, I think we'll have a more liberal approach to learning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the patience. I'm, I'm an impatient person that everybody um, who knows me knows. But um, to wait for, for you to have kids, because I want you to do all kinds of things before that happens. But um for education to change. But but in this this thinking, you know, I heard you say something there that was about the fact that you they're worried about getting into college. And so I'm thinking about your college application process because you're about to graduate and move into that the university um, moment of your life. And about how many college admissions officers that I've talked to and a lot of the schools that I've talked to, they're looking for people like you who have been able to exhibit your learning in a way that is really strong. You've got your podcast as well as your transcript and all these other accomplishments in your life. But even just, you know, talking to you and learning from you, they're going to know that you're actually interested in learning, right? And so, um, so I feel like this, the different ways to show evidence of learning that you have been able to experience through some alternative, you know, classes and, and courses that you've chosen, that's going to actually bode well for you in this process. Um, but if you wouldn't mind in our last couple of minutes together, um, what's what's on the horizon for you? What are you thinking about doing with your future? What are you planning after you graduate? Um, what are you what are you considering? What's on the, what's on your mind before we all swoop you up and hire you to work for us? Well, I want to pursue, I'm going to pursue political science and hopefully education because I think there's a lot of intersectionality between the two. Um, I want to change things on a broader, more national level. And I think that is why I want to pursue political science. Right. And if we'll have like a minor in education, I, I will understand <laughs> kind of the system, more systematic things. Um, so policies and that's really what I want to pursue. Um, so, so after college, I hope to work at the legislature or something in policy making because um, with my debate background, I feel like that would come in handy. And I do enjoy that kind of thing, stuff. Yeah. That and it's you're such an engaging um, conversationalist and, and presenter. So I think that that's going to bode well. So I think that we can all um, very easily vote for Aria <laughs> in the future <laughs> and what we're looking for. Any of your final thoughts on, on what you want to share with us, what you want to tell to educators around the globe, um, because this is 24 hours for global. We're the, we're the last hour, I think, of the of the 24 hours um, that started in New Zealand yesterday. So what's a final thought or message that you have for educators worldwide? I think it's it's easy to get discouraged when you do this type of work because it's very difficult. You know, it's very difficult to change a 200 year old system. And I think um, although progress can be minimal sometimes, I feel like we're heading in the right direction and I, I always have a lot of hope and I feel like we need to act with hope instead of skepticism because, you know, this, this work is difficult, but I really have a lot of um, optimism and I hope that educators, for me, even in Asia, because that's where I'm from, I hope that even it spreads there because I grew up with the Japanese traditional like school systems, and I really hope that it keeps expanding to other continents as well. Well, I'm, I'm sure that it will. And, and I know um, we've talked about your family connections. There are lots of people in your family that are trying to move the, the conversation forward too. But I want to thank you for taking time out of your school day to be with us and have this conversation to share what's happening. Um, we're missing you at Schools of the Future. I think that we should um, just get you out of school tomorrow and have you come spend the whole day hanging out and, and talking about education with all these educators. So text me later so that we can get on that. But thank you so much, Aria. Yeah, no, thank you so much for inviting me. 
have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Um, there's not much else that I can say about education in terms of, you know, what's what's best because, uh, as I mentioned early on, for us in Hawaii, it is about the students. It has always been about what's best for students, and so that's why I was so excited that I could at least get this conversation, have Aria join us for this conversation today, and what's going on. I'm going to put the Beyond the Lure link in our um in the the actual the page because it's about seven minutes and i don't want to um, end things out for us um take up too much of the time with this but i also want to point towards some of the actions and, and some of the things that are coming together one of the organizations i partner with is the what school could be community we've got a free online community resource for educators where we have professional development, we have um, community connections, coaching, and teacher-led change um, based model, um, change model based on, on what teachers know can happen and confidence building small steps for educators. Within that, I highly encourage taking a look at the movie, The Innovation Playlist, which is centered in Hawaii, um, done by a Hawaii educator and with a Hawaii team and students actually um, did all of the filming and all of the editing for that film. It's an incredible film that exists in the What School Could Be um, community for free. You can see that at any time and take a look at that. Um, again, coming back around to thanking Aria for her time, making sure you understand that for us in Hawaii, the power of change, the future of education centers 100% here. We are always thinking about this and always asking the students to tell us what needs to happen for their learning journeys. So thanks so much to everybody for being here. Mahalo is our word for thank you. And I really um, want to thank not just um, anybody who's watching this and paying attention to this conversation, but all of the people that came into this um, 24 Hours for Change in Education, because in the midst of this coming together, I've continue to learn and grow. It's been an inspiring week for me to see what's going on around the world. And so thanks so much for inviting me into the conversation. And thank you to everybody who shared all of their knowledge and expertise with me. I really, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Gabriel. Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. We couldn't have had anybody better closing off our, our day, our, our year-long project. And as you said, it's been uh, a joy to behold what people are doing all over the world in different circumstances and different cultural contexts. So thanks everybody. Uh, this concludes our, our broadcast for the day. This concludes our project. But as we said with uh, every one of our segments, what, what matters is tomorrow, not today. So how we capitalize uh, these connections, how we can, can move, uh, take forward all this goodwill and these good intentions about uh, changing education. So thanks everybody. Thanks Susanna. And uh, we'll see you on the next one, whatever that is. Thank you. Cheers.